So, hello and welcome everyone to the Buddhist Recovery Network Academy. Uh, I'm Susanna joining you from Helsinki, Finland, like I said, and I will be your host today. I'm a big fan of Buddhism recovery and Buddhist recovery. I facilitate both eight-step recovery meetings and mindfulness-based addiction recovery courses here in Finland. I'm a member of the board of the Buddhist Recovery Network. And today we have a new academy teaching and new academy teacher actually also, uh, and it's offered by Walt OP. Uh, the topic of the teaching is my journey into recovery and Dharma. And I will tell you a little bit more about Walt in just a moment and about the teaching, but first some practicalities. So thanks everyone for being here and being part of our community today, whatever time of the day it is. For me, it's 8 p.m., but it might be that some of you, it's, it's early in the morning, and it's really nice that you are here with us to start the day or end it, whatever your time zone is. So uh, the format for the next 60, about 60 minutes is that there will be a short period of meditation led by our teacher, then there will be teaching, and at the end, you have a possibility uh, to ask questions and a few words about Dana. So all of, our uh, all of our teachings are given freely. So we don't ask for any money for you to come here. And uh, we are still blessed to have some amazing teachers who have experience on the cushion, experience working with body, speech and mind, experience in the ongoing practice of recovery by the way of Dharma. And as we practice the Buddha's teaching of generosity, we invite you to give dana, dana that will be given to support our ongoing Buddhist Recovery Network meetings and to support the teacher. You can give on a one-time or recurring basis using the link that will be posted into the chat field by our tech, who hopefully is here <laughs> already. So uh, please be sure to indicate that your donation is for the Academy and we sincerely thank you for your generosity. And then I would like to introduce our guest teacher. Uh, so we have Walt OP. Um, I will be highlighting you um, later on, or maybe if our tech is here, uh, they could highlight. Highlight, uh, Walt, please. So Walt OP is a Buddhist teacher in the inside meditation tradition. He was trained to teach through the Spirit Rock Community Dharma Leaders program, mentored by Kevin Griffin, and more recently as part of the 2017 through 2021 Inside Meditation Societies, so that is IMS, Retreat Teacher Training Program. Walt has led, led sitting groups spe specifically for people in addiction recovery since 2000, and 11, wow. He has also served as a volunteer facilitator in a, in a California prison for many years. His journey into recovery began uh, at the age of 21. He lives in Berkeley, California with his wife and their young daughter. And his website is, is, uh, will be posted to the chat field. So, so the topic of the teaching is my journey into recovery and Dharma. And this is what Walt says about this uh, topic. Since this is my first time speaking at the BRN Academy, I thought I would share some stories about my personal journey with you. I've been in recovery from drugs and alcohol since 1987, and there have been plenty of ups and downs along the way. Finding the practice of insight meditation and Buddha's path of liberation gave me a new sense of possibility in my life after years of being clean and sober in 12-step meetings. I finally learned how to be more self-reliant. As the Buddha instructed in one sutta, dwell with, with yourselves as your own island, with yourselves as your own refuge, with no other refuge, dwell, uh, dwell with the Dharma as your island, with the Dharma as your refuge, with no other refuge. Of course, Sangha, so that means community, is vital, vitally important too. 
So welcome, Walt. It is such a big pleasure to have you here tonight. I'm so excited. So the screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here with the BRN. I, <clears throat> I've known about the Buddhist Recovery Network for quite a long time. I went to the first conference. There was one in LA. I don't even know what year that was, <laughs> but I was there um, checking it out. And uh, I just love uh, the work that uh, Buddhist Recovery Network does connecting us all with uh, you know these Buddhist recovery type of meetings and with this Academy now which is amazing so I'm aware that we usually start with a meditation which is my favorite part anyway <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just jump right into the meditation and I'll ring a bell when we're done so um, hopefully you'll be able to hear it with the power of zoom and the musicians feature on <laughs> all right so uh go ahead and find a comfortable posture for your meditation uh, if you needed to lie down to take care of your body that would be fine um, i usually meditate sitting up simply because if i lie down i'm too too likely to fall asleep but um <clears throat> and yeah we just settle into your posture it, it's actually good to take a few moments to find the right posture so that you can settle into some stillness and not need to keep adjusting if possible as you sit, although you can always adjust if needed. So you might take a deep breath or two here at the beginning as a way to connect with the breath and arrive more fully in this body and in this present moment. And just notice there is this body sitting here or lying down. You might feel the contact with the chair or cushion, or you might feel the hands or the feet. It's a real invitation to just drop down into our bodies. <clears throat> Often we're kind of in the control tower, imaginary control tower up in our heads. And a little more than needed you might say so we're establishing mindfulness by dropping our awareness down into the body anchoring in the body what i notice of course if you have some trauma and it's not comfortable to be fully in your body then take care of yourself obviously take you can find maybe a part of the body that feels uh, comfortable for you but in general we just connect with that sense of this body sitting here and then I like to use the breath as an anchor for my meditation um, breathing in I know I'm breathing in breathing out I know I'm breathing out we can keep it pretty simple. If And if you have a practice that you prefer, obviously, please work with your own practice. These are just uh, some offerings in case they're useful. You can follow the breath at the tip of the nostrils, or you can just know that when you're breathing in, you're breathing in. When you're breathing out, you're breathing out. And where you might be aware of sounds arising and passing away. We t I tend to leave them in the background for now as I meditate. Stay more present with the breath and the sense of the body sitting here.
And we try to cultivate a, an attitude of kindness and curiosity as we sit. So kind of open, receptive, noticing what's here and our might be noticing what, uh, what emotions are here. Just making space for that. Part of the practice is befriending ourselves. Of course, we, know, we may notice that the mind has a mind of its own, as we say. So we try to just have some patience with our busy mind. I'll give it a, a space to begin to settle, not trying to stop thinking in any way. Just letting the thoughts gradually calm down as we are aware of thoughts without getting so involved in the thoughts letting the thoughts arise and pass away. And I do have a trick that I like to use if my mind's really busy, which is to do a short gratitude list. Just thinking of, say, three things that I'm grateful for in this moment. So it can be very simple. I'm grateful for the Buddhist Recovery Network for giving us this chance to gather together in community on Zoom. I'm grateful for my daughter who's not banging on the door trying to get into the office right now. <clears throat> and I'm grateful to be clean and sober today. One last uh, suggestion is to look for what one of my teachers calls the subtle joy of being in the present moment. So when we're, we're not lost in a story or a plan and we can really drop into this felt sense of the body sitting here and we're present with the breath we can start to connect with a, a subtle sense of joy of just being here in this present moment in an undistracted way. Ah, and it can be a little bit of an awe moment. And we don't, we can't force this, but we, we are open to it. We 
invite this kind of joy, wholesome type of joy, whenever it is available. Okay. <laughs> so when you're ready, you can come back to the Zoom room, so to speak. <laughs> that ends the meditation. But of course, you could also continue to meditate as you listen to the talk, if you wish. You, one of my teachers would always say, keep 80% of your attention on your self as you listen to me because you're still going to be able to hear right even if you're practicing <laughs> so i don't always do that but you could try that um and as susanna said and hopefully you can hear me okay i got my volume up pretty high and i'll try to speak up um so i thought i would share a little bit about my journey in recovery and buddhism just uh seem like a good place to start <laughs> and uh, hopefully it's not too self-indulgent or something but I um, just thought it might be a, a way to approach today's talk and I am trying to work on a memoir about that so <laughs> uh, you're helping me by allowing me to talk about this um, so I grew up in a small town in Virginia not a lot of Buddhism there, so we we went to church every Sunday, <laughs> that kind of thing. But um, and my parents were big social drinkers, and so were my grandparents. It seemed like a big part of the culture, um, and so for whatever reason, I ended up I began my drinking career and smoking weed at around age eleven, um, and. I'm still figuring out how it got to that, but um, I'm really in, you know, one of my passions is reading about modern neuroscience and addiction and things like that. So um, I love different books. Uh, one book I'm reading right now is Gabor Mate's The Myth of Normal. He talks about, um, he's a Canadian doctor. He talks about um, addiction in a very compassionate way and he talks about how 
that it, it often comes out of, you know, some kind of pain, especially childhood trauma. It could be big, big T trauma or little T trauma, they say. Um, so it's not always that obvious what this is coming out of, and there may be some genetic component. I did find out that on my mother's side there was a lot of alcoholism that was not that was kind of hidden carefully um so who knows but um but i do think that there was something going on that made me uh you know helped me find drugs and alcohol at a very early age and um part of it was the first time i did it there was a big thrill a big rush uh, you might call it a dopamine rush. Another book that I really like right now is Dopamine, <laughs> Dopamine Nation <laughs> by Anna Lemke, which is also about addiction. So um, these are informing my current understanding of, of addiction. I just like to always be learning. And uh, I think the Buddha encouraged us to do this as well. He always said, don't just take my word for it, but check out all my teachings for yourself. See if they work for you. That's one of the approaches about Buddhism that really attracted me early on. This kind of, um, that kind of attitude of don't just take my word for it, but see if it works for you. Um, but uh, Gabor Mate in The Myth of Normal says, addictions represent in their onset the defenses of an organism against suffering it does not know how to endure. In other words, we're looking at a natural response to unnatural circumstances, an attempt to soothe the pain of injuries occurred in childhood and stresses sustained in adulthood. And so, again, take, take that for, you can try that on and see if that works for you, but I find that to be very interesting to um, look at for myself. So, um, my childhood was pretty normal, though, I have to say. I had two parents. I had a younger brother and me. We lived in a brick house. <laughs> um, you know, everything was fairly normal on the outside. But um, like I said, I started using pretty early. And then I started blacking out drinking by the age of 14. Um, so that was kind of how things started going pretty quickly. Um, it just basically had that inability to stop once I started using. And uh, so that kind of went on for my teen years. And uh, I'm not going to go into a huge long drunkalogue, but I just want to give you a quick sense of that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it really just became kind of what I was interested in, <laughs> you know, partying on the weekends in particular. Um, and then, uh, but what this brought was a lot of conflict in my house with me and my parents. So um, they didn't know how to deal with me, especially because they kept catching me with marijuana. And they, they didn't, I later found out my mom told me recently that they just really were completely baffled. This was in the, what, 70s? <laughs> and it just wasn't something they knew how, they didn't expect their kids to show up with pot at such an early age and they didn't really know what to do about it. So then I just was playing cat and mouse with my parents for many, what seemed like quite a few years there. Um, and then I got grounded a lot. So I got caught drinking in public with some friends and I got grounded over that. The police caught me. <laughs> uh, we brilliantly were drinking under a street light at a baseball game in the parking lot. And so these undercover police officers in a Volkswagen bug busted us, <laughs> which I still think is kind of funny that they were driving a Volkswagen bug. Um, but anyway, um, so I was grounded a lot. And what's interesting about that is, so I spent a lot of time alone in my room, which was great preparation for a future Buddhist going on retreat. <laughs> right. And uh, I was reading books like The Dharma Bombs by Jack Kerouac. So there was some, there was some Buddhist interest early on. And I also, uh, some, at some point I decided that meditation seemed very appealing. And I had heard of TM, uh, Transcendental Meditation. And somehow I got a brochure with a picture of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on it. 
who was also the teacher for the Beatles, which I think had some effect here. Um, but anyway, I um, made up my own mantra because I knew you had to have a mantra and I didn't have a teacher. And, uh, and I started meditating while I was grounded in my room. And there was a, uh, a day where I was meditating and I was really always in conflict with my father. I thought at this point that I hated my father's guts. Like I just didn't think I could like live in the same house with him anymore. And this one day I was meditating and I dropped down below all this anger that I had towards my father. And I connected with the love that I still had for him. And I realized, oh, I still, I love my father. I'm just angry at him right now. I'm just pissed off because he's getting in the way of my, you know, using really. <laughs> Uh, I didn't have that language then, but I, when I look back on it now, he was kind of disrupting my addictions of choice, you know. Um, so I, but it was really kind of a, a powerful moment to really realize that that you could drop below all that anger and connect with love. And uh, so then I even went downstairs because he was what he would watch football a lot. So he was it was like a Sunday afternoon or something. He was watching football. And I just sat next to him on the couch and watched football with him and tried to see, do I, do I still love him or am I, do I hate him again now that I'm in the same room with him? And I, and I could still stay connected to that feeling of, oh, I still love my father. Um, so anyway, that was just a, a, an important moment. And at that point, I tried to recruit my friends to meditate with me. And there were no takers. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> no interest. They were all in high school. So... <laughs> still have a friend who lived next door to me and kids me about that. Um, all right. So that was just a little history, um, of my Earl. And I also had a, I was on the tennis team in high school and our tennis coach was in, interested in Buddhism. So he did also instill some, uh, interest in me. Um, and one thing that happened was, uh, we, I should say we were the stoner tennis team. So everybody, our, uh, our shirts were the, uh, boast. There was a company called boast from Canada, I believe. And they had the Canadian maple leaf was the symbol, but it looked like a pot plant. <laughs> so we all thought we were the coolest tennis team ever. Cause we had what we thought was like a pot plant emblem on our, anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> so, um, there was a sort of a mixed thing about the whole tennis team, <laughs> but on my, uh, senior, the year before, uh, sorry, the night before my senior year of playing tennis, which I was excited about, um, I went skiing and while, uh, and I broke my thumb. So my whole tennis team, my whole tennis uh, season was wiped out because I broke my right thumb and I was right-handed and I couldn't play. I had a cast for, six weeks or something. So I couldn't play, um, tennis anymore. And my coach, uh, gave me the Alan Watts book, the wisdom of insecurity, um, which is Buddhist philosophy, philosophy. Um, and it really became like a mantra for me. I was like, how could there be wisdom and insecurity? What does this mean? I'm still not sure. I totally understand why I used the word insecurity, but I did I've eventually I would call it the wisdom of understanding impermanence, right? Anything can happen anytime. Uh, Joseph Goldstein, one of my teachers says that a lot. And I, it's been a very helpful mantra to me. Anything can happen anytime because we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen today. We think we do. <laughs> and it, it might be relatively predictable, but that don't know mind can be very helpful to cultivate because we really don't know what today or tomorrow will bring. And, uh, that also helps so that then I'm a little bit more prepared if something unexpected happens and I don't necessarily have to like run back to drugs and alcohol to cope with it. Cause I'm like, uh, like, uh, Susana read in my, um, uh, that quote from the Buddha where he says, be a refuge unto yourselves. Um, you know, that, that we can, learn to be more self-reliant and that we can tolerate the difficult, the uncomfortable. That's one of the most important things that I've learned from mindfulness practice, Buddhist practice is that because I used to really not like pain or discomfort. 
and I would look for a way to escape it at any cost, you know. Uh, and now I've realized that it's all very impermanent, that I can be with the difficult and get through it and I'll be okay. <laughs> and I, I can see that it's, uh, so that's been one of the most important things I've probably learned from my Buddhist practice over the years is that I can get through difficult moments and I'm going to be okay. You know? Um, so <clears throat> anyway, just to, uh, so the, there was the wisdom of insecurity book, which, uh, just kind of was very interesting to me. Then I ended up, uh, just gonna, I ended up in college, my drinking and using just took off, you know, I was totally, uh, out of my parents house could do whatever I wanted so um, my college career was really about partying and not so much about studying well, sadly um, and that's kind of where I ended up hitting bottom my senior year of college because it just I kept blacking out waking up in weird circumstances and not remembering how I got there and then it culminated in waking up in jail in North Carolina, not knowing how I got there. <laughs> I didn't, um, and I had had a car crash. Um, I mean, to my slight credit, I'm not, I, I had uh, given my keys to somebody else and they had driven me to this bar on my last big night of drinking. Uh, but then for some reason, they must've given me my keys back after they, we got to the bar and then I got cut off at the bar, thrown out of the bar. And then I got in my car and drove myself away and had a car crash into a parked truck on a dead end street. So I'm very grateful that I didn't injure anybody else. Um, I went through the windshield, however, so that wasn't great. Um, so I had a black eye. So I woke up in jail with a black eye. My right eye was swollen shut. And I didn't remember the car accident, although I was, you know, later pieced it all together. As a result of that, I ended up uh, going to court and the judge recommended, well, somehow it was re recommended that I needed to go to a 28 day treatment program. And uh, that turned out to be a huge blessing in my life because that taught me a lot about alcoholism and, and addiction. Um, and I also was introduced to 12 step programs, which was helpful. And they also gave me guided meditation tapes to listen to. Um, so I started listening to, because my mind was so nuts, you know, I was all over the place and it, they thought I, it would help me calm down. <laughs> and so that was also, um, an important aspect of it. Um, so then I was in early recovery, uh, got out of the treatment center, went to meetings, uh, ended up going to California, uh, for a few weeks in, in Southern California and went to some meetings there. And that kind of opened my eyes to the, like, there's a whole huge world of people in recovery. Cause in my small town in Virginia, I got sober in Charlottesville, Virginia. There weren't a lot of young people. There were a small core of us. There, it, it didn't seem to be that huge of a program. I mean, there were there were plenty of meetings, but it wasn't. It felt a little grim that this was going to be my life. But when I went to LA, it just felt like wow. There's hundreds, thousands of people in recovery, and there's, you know, just like somehow it really opened up my eyes. So I ended up moving to California. Um, I'll try to speed this up. And uh, after a few years. I met this woman at an art gallery. I was studying photography in California. And uh, I met this woman who said, I want to take you to hear Jack Cornfield speak at Spirit Rock on Monday night. I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> like I'd never heard of Jack Cornfield, never heard of Spirit Rock. Um, but I just thought, well, I, I like this person. She's um, been helpful to me in the past. So I went to with her and that ch kind of changed my life. So I heard Jack Cornfield speak. That was the first real Buddhist teacher I'd ever heard speak. He talked a lot about Ajahn Chah, the Thai forest master, who was his teacher in Thailand when he was a monk there. And the, t the, the stories about Ajahn Chah really captured my imagination and really spoke to me. And uh, 
at the same time I was going to 12 step, a 12 step meeting that had a um, candlelight meditations period, kind of like we did today where we'd meditate for 10 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. And I had started to realize that I really looked forward to that 10 minute meditation every week. I wasn't meditating at home on my own, but that, that became like the highlight of my week was 10 minutes staring at a candle, you know, on College Avenue in, in Berkeley. And um, so there was that plus the Jack Cornfield thing. And, and uh, so then I started going to Jack Cornfield and uh, here's the cautionary tale. It took me 12 years to finally go on my first retreat. <laughs> so I got really interested in Buddhism at that point. And I went to Jack Cornfield a lot and I thought it sounded great. I would suffer through the meditation period to hear Jack speak. <laughs> it was like, uh, that was really hard to sit through that 35 minute period. The 10 minutes was fine. 35 minutes was a lot, but, um, so because I'm running low on time, I'm just kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Um, so in 2005, I was unemployed going through a divorce, <laughs> but still thankfully in recovery, although I'd had cl very close to a relapse at one point in there too, where somebody offered me some champagne and I really wanted to drink it. <laughs> it was like somebody that didn't know I was in recovery. Um, it was like very hard to stop myself from drinking that champagne this one day. Um, and so I got to really hit a low peak in recovery and it was like 15, 16 years into recovery. I talked about there were ups and downs, right? Um, and I started to think, well, what, you know, I should be happier than this. I'm, I'm sober. I'm clean and sober. I'm, I, I do a lot of good things, but I'm not, things are not going well. And it, something occurred to me, well, Jack Cornfield talks about these retreats. Maybe I should try one of those. <laughs> so in a way I got desperate enough to go on a retreat <laughs> and it was only a five day retreat, but I signed up for one and I went on this retreat and it really made a difference. <laughs> like I really felt like this is what I've been looking for. Um, I just took to it immediately and, um, it was, you know, I had a good retreat and then I, uh, signed up for a 10 day retreat right after that. So I went on a 10 day retreat and that one probably is the one that changed my life, you know, because, um, I felt like there was no going back from that point. Uh, I just loved the practice of meditating all day and, um, the walk sit, we would do sitting, walking in silence. Um, and I started to really befriend my own mind, I think. And I also did start to have some interesting meditative experiences. So I don't want to <laughs> not claiming anything, but you know, you can start to get concentrated. You can start to see the power of the mind. Um, and I got a taste of that early on. And, um, I think that my years in recovery, one thing I was doing, we call it Sila practice in Buddhism, which is, ethical behavior. I was working on my ethical behavior for the first 15, 16 years. I did, you know, I was going to talk more about this, but I, I had lied a lot growing up to, I had to lie to my parents all the time about my drinking and using, uh, I had had this bad habit of lying, but in recovery, I had learned to be honest and tell the truth to people. And I was like really committed to being honest all the time, no matter what. And that was a powerful practice for me. Um, and uh, so I learned a lot in those first 15, 16 years. But so by the time I hit the cushion on my first retreats, uh, I was really, I had laid the groundwork for a deep meditation practice. So it kind of took off quickly, I think. And uh, not only that, but I ended up getting a job at the retreat center, Spirit Rock, <laughs> after that second retreat. So that really helped. <laughs> Cause then I was around it all the time and we got free retreat time every year, paid retreat time every year there. So, so I spent a lot of time, uh, whenever I could going on retreats and then studying Buddhism, taking classes because I worked there and just learning a lot. And I also met Kevin Griffin somewhere in here <laughs> who, uh, I'm sure many of you know, the, 
He wrote One Breath at a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps. He had a sitting group in Berkeley. I started going to that. And I would stay afterwards and just pepper him with questions <laughs> about the connections between the Twelve Steps and Buddhism and recovery. And I just really felt like I was uh, finding my way in the world <laughs> at this point. That was all coming together, you know. And so that's why I love the Buddhist Recovery Network. Because for me, this this has been such a blessing in my life to bring Buddhism and recovery together um, has really just continued to, I just wouldn't want my life to be any different than it is today because of all of what I've discovered. Uh, so I continue to go on many retreats. Um, I took my time before I went on a long retreat. I was thinking about this. So I didn't go on a long retreat until I had a senior teacher say, I think it's time for you to do like a two month retreat. Walt. And so that's, that's when I did it, when I felt like I had really um, prepared myself for that. Because being alone with your own mind for two months, if you're not ready for it, can be a little intense, right? So, um, but fortunately, I think I went at the right time. And I really, again, I just um, enjoyed a lot of, of this uh, deep concentration practice and the power of my own mind in a he healthy, positive way. Um, and, uh, eventually I wanted to give back. So I ended up, uh, I did a teacher training called the community Dharma leaders training program through spirit rock. And Kevin Griffin was my mentor, mentoring teacher for that. And then I started my own group for people. It was called, it was based on Kevin's work originally Dharma and recovery. So I started a Dharma and recovery group with his blessing in Berkeley. And I did that weekly for uh, eight or nine years or something, learned a lot from that. Probably wasn't always the, you know, there was a lot I needed to learn uh, how to give talks and things like that. But um, but it was a wonderful experience. And then I've done a continue to do things like take Buddhism into the prisons because I thought there must be a lot of people suffering from addiction issues in prison. Uh, no surprise, there were, there are. <laughs> so that felt rewarding to go in and meet with those guys. Um, and uh, then I also helped start an eight step recovery program through the East Bay Meditation Center with my friend Shahara Godfrey and uh, Vimal Sara's help as well. So I've done a lot of different things. Um, I guess I'm about out of time here, but uh, it's just been a wonderful journey. Um, the, you know, the, there's no end to all the teachings that I've gotten and uh, the um, and you know that that I can so I, I started out I was a very negative thinker as well I could be very pessimistic and uh, through Buddhist practice you know I've learned to cultivate these wholesome mind states of loving kindness compassion appreciative joy which is like appreciating when others um, reap the benefits of their own wholesome actions is one way to think of that. And then also equanimity, uh, which we used to call serenity, right? But I have so much more equanimity than I ever did before. Like I said, so when difficult things happen, I don't have to become Mr. Reactive and get all pissed off or whatever. I can, I can work with it. I can stay equanimous in the moment and be helpful and find a solution rather than become part of the problem. Am I always perfect with this? No, <laughs> but it's gotten way better. All right. Well, thank you for listening. I, I, there's much more that could be said, but I think we're out of time. Uh, but I did want to have a few minutes to hear from you all. Um, one of my favorite things is actually question and response um, to hear what's on your mind and then try to respond. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Walt, and thank for your, you know, uh, very, very clear sharing. And uh, you, you really, I can, I can sense the depth of uh, recovery that you have, the depth of uh, experience that you have. Very meaningful what you were sharing with us uh, tonight. And the good thing is that you know you can come back and you can continue from the place where you left off, you know, next year. <laughs> so uh, yes. So now it's time for the Q and A. And um,
way for everybody. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Walt. I think that, you know, uh, what I think is that it's su super helpful and also also your share and how you how you got to the Buddhism and how you got Buddhism and recovery combined. Your experience has been so beautiful. So thank you for that. And it's been great that you came to us to our to teach with us. And uh, it was so nice to get to know you. And now I'm going to say a few words about Dana. Uh, your generosity can help to strengthen the recovery community and to grow the academy and can be a practical expression of gratitude and metta. So we invite you to practice generosity and to give Dana in support of these teachings to be shared with our teacher and with the Buddhist Recovery Network. So there will be uh, links in the chat. So there will be a link to the BRN website. And uh, when you give uh, the Dana, please indicate that it's for the Academy. And if you don't indicate, don't worry, because if you uh, give the Dana during this uh, session or right after, you know, it's always put under the Dana. So uh, no worries about that. And then we have, uh, we have a, a Facebook group and uh, link of that is gonna be in the chat as well. And when you come, please answer the membership quest questions because every time, time, even though I say it here, there are plenty of people who don't answer them and we don't accept you if you don't answer the questions. So we want you to come, but please just, you know, take some couple of minutes to answer the questions. We want to keep it the safe space. So that's why the questions are there. And uh, the next uh, BRN Academy event is gonna be on Sunday. Uh, it's going to be in the beginning, it's going to be in uh, uh, the 7th of uh, January, yes, and uh, it's going to be with uh, Vimal Sara. And then what else? Uh, there is also a weekly Buddhist recovery meeting. The type of the meeting changes weekly, you can check the schedule on the web page using the link that is now in the chat. So that will be there as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> Tyler is sending thanks to me. You know, it's it's kind of like cocktail effect. You know that when you hear your name in a crowded room, when I see my name in the chat that is going very fast, I can, I can just see it from there. So that's why I my attention went there. Okay, so let's take a breath together. And then we transfer our merits. So thank you for joining us today. May the merit we have gained go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. May we all be happy. May we all be peaceful. May we all be safe. So thank you, everybody. We will keep the room open for a few moments for you to get the links in there. And uh, there was somebody saying earlier that they need help. Uh, you can stay after and uh, get some resources. So, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.